Hello, everyone. We're going to start in just a minute. Thank you everyone for being here. We're gonna get started in just a minute. Just gonna give people some time to enter. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. Um, this talk is called On Memory and Practice. It's an artist talk with Lenny Wong and Tomia Arai. For those of you who are new to Duderne, Duderne is a leading nonprofit cultural institution dedicated to serving established and emerging artists through the collaborative creation of contemporary art using the process of hand paper making. New York based artists, Wenny Wong, our 2002 workspace resident and Tomia Arai, our 1991 workspace resident, will share how their practices relate to their personal and cultural histories, memory, and art making, each exploring layered narratives of what it means to be a femme Asian American artist influenced by their upbringing, background, and the current moment while questioning the current space. Can the current or can the pursuit of one's own creation shatter and outgrow the current understanding of identity and history? This talk is moderated by curator Vivian Sangsuara Scythian, um, and we'll have a Q&A at the end of this presentation. A few technical notes. This talk will last about 50 minutes with 10 minutes for questions at the end. If you have questions, feel free to navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and click the Q&A function and enter your questions into the Q&A. Um, we'll answer all of your questions at the end of the session. Um, this session will be recorded and made available on our website in about two weeks. Um, if you're interested in watching any of our previous webinars, just navigate to the Duterte YouTube channel or to the events page on our website to access video links. Um, and I'm gonna introduce our speakers. Tomia Arai is a public artist who works with local communities to create visual narratives that give meaning to the spaces we live in. Through a framework of collaboration, Arai uses the specificity of her experience as an Asian American and as, um, as a personal space in which to locate broader issues of race and gender, a space through which a glimpse of common ground is made possible. Working towards a more equitable art world and addressing issues of racial justice are at the heart of her artistic practice. Arai has designed both temporary and permanent public works of art for creative time the Smithsonian Institute and U.S. General Services Administration Art in Architecture Program, the NYC Percent for Art Program, the MTA Arts for Transit Program, the National Endowment, and the San Francisco Arts Commission. She is the co-founder of the Chinatown Art Brigade, an Asian diasporic cultural collective that centers art and culture as a way to support community-led campaigns to fight displacement. Arai is currently a 2002 Transnational Fellow with Monument Lab, an initiative that reimagines public space through stories of social justice and equity. Um, Wenny Wong is a mixed media artist living and working in Brooklyn, New York. She has created work through artist residencies at the Center for Book Arts, Sculpture Space, Lower East Side Print Shop, Dudonay Paper Mill, and the Ragdale Foundation and she is the recipient of grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, New York, uh, New York Foundation for the Arts, the New Schools Innovations and Education Fund, and a permanent art commission through New York City's 
percent for art program. In 2002, she became an art ambassador for Royal Talons North America. She teaches at Parsons School of Design, the 92nd Street Y Art Center, Wave Hill, and the Pastel Society of America, where she is a signature member. Her recent work consists of drawings, collaborations, and site-specific installations, which explore relationships between identity and loss, landscape, and collective memory. As a second-generation Asian American woman, she is interested in the impact of cultural myths on uh, preconceptions about ethnicity and social inheritance, how nature, land, and the urban environment act as symbols of national identity, as well as private makers of time and space. By relocating these myths as sculptural bodies within local environments, new metaphors, meanings, and narratives emerge. Um, and then our curator, Vivian Sangsuara Sipian, is a Miami-born bicultural Chinese and Thai independent curator and creative director. Her projects focus on themes of otherness, migration, and how personal voices and experiences can translate across different people and mediums while ex exploring expanding fields of contemporary cultural production. Vivian has worked in the arts for the last 10 years with Sotheby's, The Armory Show, Art Basel Miami Beach, Asia Week New York, and the Shanghai Museum. And I'd just like to say a quick thank you to the Wingate Foundation for generously supporting this program. Um, thank, thank you uh, for being here, everybody, today. Um, Vivian, I'm going to hand it off to you. OK, thank you. Um, thanks for that, Willa. And, um, I had the pleasure of curating this exhibition from Dudenay's collection. And um, I'm just going to share with you a little presentation of some of the photos of artworks that are included in the exhibition and um, give an overview of the themes and kind of what inspired it all. Let me just share my screen quickly. Um, Okay, I think that should be up. Can everyone see that all right? Okay, um, so this exhibition really was inspired by um, this exploration of memory and the process of memory making and how all of that kind of informs and reveals or illuminates certain parts of ourselves that are affected by um, certain markings of time and place and self and really how these artists were able to uniquely express that in relation to their own legacies and backgrounds and um, all of those emotions and processing reflected on works of paper. Um, I really thought that memory is not only a vessel for processing, but it really is a place and um, a place for healing, a home, and a place for honoring your past, and um, really a place for you to kind of connect with all the different versions of your past selves that make up your current moment. And um, I think it also represents these small internal changes or realizations and where this kind of unforming leads to a reforming. Um, and then thinking about paper as a medium, I was kind of trying to stretch that um, kind of outside of, you know, it's like tactile and versatile characteristics and characteristics and um, just thinking about how it's also an archive or a celebration and an expression of self-perception as it relates to Asian American identity. And um, in relation to paper making and memory making, I really liked this idea of layering and what forms that these works or memories take on um, and continue to exist in. So also over the course of curating the exhibition, times were drastically changing um, last year. And that also reinforced to me the power of memory and how it affects your present and how you look into your future as either a way of coping or um, as a source of hope, especially in relation to the narratives originating from Asian American communities at the moment. 
um, just how that all affects us and how we continue to create collectively and while we stay claim to our own identities on various levels. Um, and I feel really grateful to have been able to have this outlet and this project through the last year over such an uncertain period of time, just to be able to connect with artists, like have this small sense of community, um, being able to share with people in real time, hear from them their memories and experiences of and how it continues to shape and um, evolve their self-perception in relation to our world today. Um, and I think also what was interesting is that I ended up, I think, going pretty deep into Dujanay's archive where I found some pieces that were collected quite early on. Um, and in sharing that with the artists, I think that also sparked a revisiting, um, igniting them to interact with their old pieces again, old works and old parts of selves that really have always just been there and been around. Um, but sometimes we just all need a reminder, you know, to look at or look for them again. Um, so that brings me to both Wenny and Tomia, um, the artists speaking with us today. And I'm going to let them kind of dive into their art practices and, um, what it's meant for them to create through the power of memory and um, what those personal processes have been. So, um, Wenny, I'm going to hand it off to you. Okay, thank you so much, Vivian. It's, it's been incredible working with you through, through this year <laughs> on, on this remotely, you know, on this project. Um, so I'm gonna share screen as well and um, just pull up this um, presentation. And what I'm gonna do is just go through and give you a kind of context of um, at what point um, my the project I did at Dujanae sort of came about, what kind of came before and what kind of came after. Um, so just, you know, very quickly, um, some older pieces that I had done, you know, the I worked for about 10 years on a body of work that where I was really ex trying to explore my identity as um, being Asian in America, why was this particular gesture being made at me all the time wherever I went? So this was a, a facial gesture that the corners of the eyes being pulled up at me was a way for um, a gesture that people made at me, kids made at me, um, no matter where I went. And I didn't know why. I didn't understand why. And so um, in graduate school, I decided to finally adopt this gesture in my work and to sort of explore, um, you know, different, um, a different way of making work that was um, not, not just based on drawing and painting and traditional art media, but working with um, bamboo leaves that I had gathered in San Francisco Chinatown and um, photographs and photographs of my own feet. So this idea of self-portraiture, but um, exploring the idea of the Chinese um, women's bound feet. And um, this installation called Paper Daughter, I made a semi um, thesis exhibition at the University of Michigan after I'd received a number of grants to go um, and take a round trip, road, uh, road trip through the US to sort of gather information and do some research. And, um, and through that, paper daughter is a term that refers to um, women that came to the US um, after the Page Act, which was enacted in 1875 to um, uh, uh, exclude uh, Chinese women from immigrating into the US. So they would come under an assumed name. And of course, we all know the um, Chinese Exclusion Act came shortly thereafter in 1882, um, which barred Chinese laborers from entering the US. And so, um, you know, even after the, the railroads were built, there were all of, there was all this discrimination against Asians in America from a very early time. Um, I was also very influenced at that time by a number of um, uh, Asian and Asian American artists, including um, Chung, Chung Huang Chi and his series called East Meets, West, East Meets West, which are self-portraits that he did at sort of seminal locations in, in the US and, and I think around, actually around in different places. I also discovered um, Lin Yamamoto, who later became 
very good friend of mine, um, in a book, a, bo a little book, a little pamphlet book in the University of Michigan Library, where I was trying to find um, artists like me um, and what they made. Um, it's very difficult to find. So this is a work that she did with hair. Um, I later on discovered, of course, Yayoi Kusamo, who now we all know, <laughs> and has an exhibit at the New York Botanical Garden. But um, I loved her sewn pieces in particular and her performance work. So I, I um, pulled a lot from that. And I've recently discovered for myself, Ruth Asawa, although I think I believe I saw her work um, much earlier without knowing her name and was very influenced by these forms that were very sort of universal forms, um, abstract and um, sort of this repetitive form that I found interesting. So I started to do really explore this idea of identity and stereotypes. You know, um, you know, there's the stereotype of the, the, the Asian American, the pianist, right? The pianist prodigy. There's the, the takeout the people that you know have the takeout places you know there's Connie Chung these were the stereotypes that I sort of grew up with and that I was sort of trying to grapple with and I did a number of performance pieces dealing with um, you know various um, issues culture um, cultural rituals um, that I grew up with that I was trying to sort of figure out and the, the works are really sort of a, a, a place for me to explore um, ideas and histories that I was just discovering. Um, I used this family album picture from my mother's side, which shows my grandparents, actually not as the bride and groom, but the lucky couple on either side of the bride and groom. Um, and I used these pictures and also another um, album pictures from my father's side to make these kites at um, the Lower East Side print shop as part of their workspace uh, residency. And so this was the residency that I did um, as well as, these are the pair of kites here, um, as well as another residency I did at the Ragdale Foundation where I made these paper feet. These are um, feet where I wrap my own feet, you know, sort of that um, reference to the bound feet. Um, in paper and glue, and then and then cut them, cut them away, and then and then sort of you know rebound them, and um, and so this is I have over three hundred pair of these paper feet that I made in various different kinds of papers. Um, so um, and then I I happened on um, the the residency at uh, Dudenay Paper Mill, which was um, an incredible experience. Um, I was I was looking at these hats. This is a picture from um, Taiwan in bef before the war, um, where they're gathering sugarcane, and this was something that my um, paternal grandparents did before, you know, um, just after they were married as young people. And so the sugarcane industry was very strong in Taiwan. And I was looking at these hats and I was thinking about rice patties and these farmers and, and sort of um, decided I wanted it, uh, to uh, make these hats, right? Um, I wasn't really sure why, but I loved the forms. I loved, um, I wanted to make a lot of them. And so Paul, um, you can see in this picture is, is instructed me to pour concrete into the hats and you know you could see I'm like very this was like right after I just I'd given birth this was maybe six months after I had my baby Cam was my son was like five six months old and I was still breastfeeding and I'm coming into dinner and I brought my breast pump and I'm breast pumping in the bathroom and I'm you know coming out and then doing this slimy Matthew cellulose glue like on these this you know kind of wet paper pulp we cut them into triangles and then you could see we're layering the triangles on the hats and slathering them down. So this is sort of the process. I'm very lucky these, someone had taken the, these pictures of us working um, in that space when we were making them. And then we added the methyl cellulose um, that was clear with brushes. And then we let them dry and we made about, you can see the hats sort of behind me there. We made about, um, I don't know, 50, 50 of them. The hats came from just a few blocks away at the time, Dudene was on Broom Street. And so I, I got the hats from the Chinatown in that area. These are some stamp shots of my son um, right after he was born, maybe about a week. And another picture of him when he was um, you know, a few months old. And these are the pictures that I used to make some of these other pieces yet to Dudene. Um, they were paper pulp pieces, um, watermark pieces. 
and you can see this sort of process. I was thinking him like a little Buddha baby, you know, his arms are always kind of moving and he was always trying to get out of his swaddling. Um, and then this is another piece that I did based on that photograph of my, my grandmother it was the only kind of photograph that I have of her um, where she's sitting in that wedding photo as the sort of lucky woman. And, um, and so this was also with colored paper pulp. And then the piece ended up getting installed in a lot of different places. I didn't eventually show it until 2004 at the Detroit Artist Market. Um, my cousin Fangling had just passed away at that point. She was the first relative in my family to be buried um, in the United States. And there's a um, there's a there's a writing by um, Gabrielle Garcia Marquez that says you don't really belong to a country until someone of your blood has been buried in the soil. And so I, I dedicated um, this piece to her and it ended up also being just installed in a lot of different places. They always resembled mushrooms to me. And you know, it's really kind of interesting. I just realized like right before this talk, and this was very moving to me that, um, you know, um, I live by Greenwood Cemetery now in Brooklyn and I walk there a lot and I see a lot of incredible mushrooms. And I realized that, you know, it's um, this piece is it, it makes sense, <laughs> you know. Um, so this is a little fuzzy little picture of it installed at um, Dudene, um at the new location that was in Hell's Kitchen before the move to Brooklyn. And this was a, also a performance piece that I did at Florida State University, um, you know, related to the exhibition with rice. And then there were a number of other exhibitions I did um, after that that were you know, influenced or impacted by my workspace residency. Um, this was an installation of soil at the Westchester Arts Council um, where uh, people could come in and water the soil. And so that idea of value and property and um, ownership sort of kind of coalesced in this space of, that was a former bank building. There are also some other pieces. I did a residency later on at Sculpture Space um, where I used the found wood there to build these 24 hour sculptures. Every day I get up and make a new sculpture just by stacking or just from the weight of the wood. Um, I, this is, these are some other shots of things that I made. It's amazing now to see these things and to see their connection to Ruth Osawa's work. Um, here's a performance piece that I did there. Um, some other pieces that I made out of pipe cleaners, the structure, you can see some of that language of the, the trees and the red color sort of then seeping into this work that I made at the Center for Book Arts in 2008. Um, this was a, res, um, a um, I met a poet at Go at the Center for Book Arts and we are still collaborating on this very long word and image collaboration where we meet kind of weekly and we do these kind of, you know, different um, experiments with drawing and um, uh, visuals and, and words. And then eventually I also started to work with paper, piercing the paper to make different forms. This was a commission at, uh, for Edelman um, where the, you know, the form of a tree or a lung is sort of um, reinterpreted. Um, interestingly enough, called Airborne, this one. Um, and eventually I started to um, use the skills that I'd learned in making my own work um, and uh, teaching um, my students at Parsons and, um, and also youth, urban youth, how to make the kites um, and flying them and testing them um, in different places. So, um, you know, I wanted to go back to the idea of, you know, using the phot photography and, and um, that was a archival. This was the Hague Act, that, the Hart and Seller Act that was uh, signed in eight, six, 1965 was what eventually allowed my parents to emigrate to um, the United States. And, and these are some pictures that I have now that um, I used to um, make collages and mixed media works. So I continue to work with paper in this sort of small scale, especially these were all, most of them done during the pandemic at home. I'm sort of, you know, the, the photographs are with me. And so it's sort of interesting to sort of take them and sort of reinvestigate this sort of very personal history, um, you know, using these very personal media and to explore them even in a, in a sculptural sense. Um, these are some recent ones of my son also putting photographs. Again, these are like personal snapshots versus snapshots 
that were taken from art his, uh, from a historical context. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna stop the share. Um, I'm gonna pass this on, I guess, to to Tamia. Gonna thank you, Wendy. Okay. Um, let me see if I can do this. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Uh, can everyone see that? Well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Wendy, for that presentation. It was so exciting to see those process shots at Dudoné. Um, I realized that I was actually only in the second year of the Artists in Residency program. And nobody thought to take pictures in those days in 1991. So um, I had very little uh, to, to bring to this presentation from that residency, but I did manage to find this one piece that I thought I'd begin with. And, um, and before I start, I, I would like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from New York, which is the uh, home of the, the unceded territory of the Lenape people and I just wanted to acknowledge that them as the original stewards of the land we are on. So much of my work is now currently about displacement. So it feels like uh, very necessary to make that kind of acknowledgement whenever I'm able to speak publicly. Um, but I did want to start with this, this image uh, that I created during my residency at Dudonne. Um, and before I start, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna turn this timer on <laughs> so I know I stay within your time limit. Um, uh, this is actually a small edition of prints that I made uh, entitled There to Here. And um, I really hadn't looked at this piece for over 30 years. So I, I feel like uh, I, I kind of rediscovered this work through uh, my participation in this show. Um, I'm really thankful to Vivian and Dudonne for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, but it also um, you know, it triggered so many um, really wonderful memories of living and working downtown. And um, I remember that Dudonne was uh, located on Broom Street in those days and my studio was on Lisbonard Street. So um, I had to cross canal on my walks to Dulane. And I just remember so vividly uh, all the hardware stores that used to line canal. And um, in fact, it was in one of those hardware stores that I found this box of bamboo uh, teapot holders <laughs> that I used in this installation as the, um, the hangers to uh, install this piece. And um, I remember getting spray painted pearl paint, which was across the street from my studio and how much I miss that store and um, how actually beloved it was and how many artists actually work there and, and um, uh, went through that uh, really historic space um, during my early days as an artist. Um, I guess I, I am also happy to start with this piece because um, I, it brings back for me, not only so many memories, but just the, uh, the importance of um, these spaces and uh, these, these places in our lives. And um, you know, Vivian just, um, referred to memory as a place. And I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I, I am very, um, I think, uh, very involved in um, trying to protect and pre preserve spaces that are embedded with, with our memories. Um, those places that we either call home or that are part of the neighborhoods that we live in. And um, I feel that this is so much a part of, um, what has shaped my memory, my identity. Um, it isn't just um, my cultural background and my tradition, but all those 
people and spaces and relationships that I've built over, over so many years that have contributed to the way that I see the world and really what I choose to make art about now. Um, but this is, um, this is a piece that uh, really is about a journey. It's a migration story. So I thought I would um, uh, begin with my migration story as a way to sort of frame the remarks that I'll make tonight in this presentation. Um, I think that uh, it helps to understand where we come from. Um, but I also know that that's not the only thing that shapes um, who we are. And, uh, and yet I, I always like to go back to um, my beginnings. And um, I think that uh, my personal migration story actually begins with my grandparents who met and married after they immigrated to the United States in San Francisco in 1913. And um, they had six children and opened a boarding house in Sacramento and a restaurant that they call the OK Cafe that served Mexican and Japanese laborers. Um, in 1942, a year after the US declared war in Japan, um, Franklin Roosevelt uh, designated all Japanese living in America as enemy aliens. And um, through his executive order 9066, over 110,000 Japanese Americans were um, relocated and incarcerated in um, military zones spread across the West. My grandparents were sent to the Topaz Relocation Center in Utah, where they spent the rest of the war. Um, and um, I often think about that time. I mean, it's very easy to make comparisons between the detention of Japanese Americans and what has been happening on the border and what will most likely happen to people <laughs> if they don't look more critically in, in, at the carceral state that we're currently in. But um, the, the label of enemy alien and the trauma of displacement and incarceration has, has really cast a long shadow over um, the history of Japanese in America. Uh, and as a descendant of the families who were incarcerated, I'm left with the task of remembering and memorializing this legacy of displacement and loss. And I, and I actually draw a line, a straight line between this experience and the work that I'm currently doing to fight gentrification uh, and displacement across um, New York. Um, I try to imagine what it'd be like to be ordered to leave your home with only what you can carry. And um, in my grandparents' case, it was the loss of their livelihood, their family heirlooms, the photographs, the books, the friendships that they made and um, the community that it left behind that completely devastated them. And it's something that I think um, I'm trying to recover in, in the work that I'm doing now. Um, after the war and the camps closed, dispersing families across the country, my parents met and married uh, and settled in New York where I was born and raised. Um, in post-war New York, Harlem was one of the few areas in the city where Japanese were welcomed and um, could find, could actually find housing. So it became a temporary home for a large extended family uprooted by the internment. It was not long before a small enclave of Japanese Americans could be found living in Upper Manhattan. And this recent portrait of my extended family sitting on a stoop in Harlem reflects the global mix, what I like to think is a global mix of cultures resulting from a century long journey that has taken my family from Japan to Harlem, from Toysan, Trinidad, India, Poland and Mississippi to New York. 
Well, my personal exploration of the immigrant experience emerged from a desire to acknowledge, I guess I should go back, sorry, um, the uprootedness, our uprootedness, our, our shared uprootedness and give meaning to the new spaces we live in. And these migration stories help me navigate um, a path through what uh, cultural activist Rob Roberto Bedoya has referred to um, the politics of belonging and disbelonging. Before you can have spaces of belonging, he said, you must feel you, you belong. And from the very beginning of my career, I've tried to understand the depth and meaning of community through my work and through um, workspace programs um, and print and paper making studios like Doudonnet, Bob Blackburn's printmaking workshop, the Lower East Side Print Shop, the Women's Studio Workshop, and the Center for Book Arts, um, who, who were all so instrumental in um, giving me the ability to develop an art, <coughs> excuse me, art practice built on collaboration and exchange. Um, many of these spaces were founded in the 1970s and were artists run and artist centered and encouraged artists to share ideas, work across disciplines, experiment with the printed image and build their own artist communities. Robert Blackburn, uh, seen here in this print by Jason Sons, was instrumental in mentoring and training hundreds of artists of color from all parts of the globe during his lifetime. I learned how to print at Bob Blackburn's and how to silk screen at the Lower East Side Print Shop and took those skills with me to other shops, other residencies and projects that use the printed image to transform the public spaces that we live in. Whoops, so I've already used up my 10 minutes. <laughs> well, let me see if I can do the next <laughs> few slides. Um, since uh, our time, my time is so limited, I just really wanted to focus on a, a couple of projects that um, may give you an idea of how I address themes of mem memory and history and the passage of time. And um, I think that I'll focus actually on, on this project, uh, which is a, um, a mural that was created in 1991, the same year that I was in residence at Doudonnet. Um, in, I'm sorry, in 1997, um, and uh, to commemorate the discovery of an African burial ground in Lower Manhattan. This is an 80 foot uh, monoprint uh, on canvas that was installed in the Federal Building, 290 Broadway. Um, the African burial ground was uh, recognized as one of the most important archaeological finds of the century, and um, it was the mural that I made was, pay, was uh, created to pay tribute to the first enslaved African-Americans who, whose labor helped to build colonial New York. Um, I, and I also really want to acknowledge the fact that um, even though I wasn't African-American, there were five artists chosen to create artwork for this site. And I was, uh, I'm deeply honored actually to have been chosen and encouraged to create work. Um, what I considered to be a shared history of slavery um, and how important it was that people um, believed that this story needed to be told in as many ways and with as many voices as possible. Um, in this design, a narrative is presented as a series of overlapping images arranged to suggest the process of archaeology, of digging through layers of historical fragments in order to reveal an untold story about a period of time, similar to the archeological process of discovery and the painstaking sifting through information. There is no chronology of events presented in this mural. A timeline has been replaced with a layered reading of events, which more closely resemble the actual way in which we learn about the past. During this process, I was uh, deeply inspired by the writing of Toni Morrison, who described her own writing as a process of archaeology. Uh, in her essay, The Site of Memory, she says about her family, 
These people are my access to me. They are my entrance to my own interior life, which is why the images that float around them, the remains, so to speak, of, at the archeological site surface first, and they surface so vividly and so compellingly that I acknowledge them as my route to, to the reconstruction of a new world. Um, so this process of layering of um, using silkscreen as a way to create um, a multiple images that um, can be rearranged and arranged to, um, to tell visual narratives is something that I've uh, incorporated in, in a lot of my work, uh, especially work about um, history and, and shared stories. Um, this is, a, you know, going, I guess, back to the um, macro, the micro. Um, this is actually, um, uh, and the hyperlocal, this is a story about, based on my mother and her battle with Alzheimer's. Um, each of these tablets represent a year of her life. There are 88 of them and they're inscribed um, with this text that she wrote in, in uh, the um, end days of, of her struggle with the disease. Uh, she um, really stopped speaking, but she was able to copy this text over and over again, which actually is a description of her home in Hawaii. Um, how many steps there were, how many rooms there were, um, the order that people took a bath in. <laughs> um, she just uh, wrote this over and over again, and I guess it's a way for her not to forget. And it's something that I wanted to build a piece around. Um, this story, uh, this, this banner was created um, to, uh, to recognize the impact of the war in Afghanistan on um, and the collateral damage of war on, on innocent civilians. Um, it's entitled The Shape of Me and it's a silkscreen monoprint um, that's made up of dozens of images of Afghan men and women superimposed over images from the Vietnam War. Um, it was uh, sponsored by American Friends uh, Service Committee and it was a way to, it was traveling exhibit of banners and murals that um, really uh, told the story of the impact of the, the war in Afghanistan, uh, not only on, on um, people who lived there, but you know, the impact over time of these wars that were conducted by the US in Asia and the Middle East on, on our own um, sense of ourselves and our national identity which is why it is called the shape of me, because I feel um, the, those wars had so much to do with how I was treated as an Asian living in America, but also how I saw myself um, in, in the US and in the world. Uh, so I know we have uh, a little, very little time. Um, I'm actually just going to skip a little to um, the work that I'm currently doing uh, and amazingly, I'm still able to do during the pandemic, but as a founder of the Chinatown Art Brigade, we are still centering um, fighting gentrification and displacement in the work we do as a cultural collective. And um, you know, I, uh, this not only includes um, working closely with our partners, uh, the Chinatown Tenants Union, uh, doing workshops and supporting their campaigns to fight evictions, but uh, you know, this includes large scale, did include large scale light projections, but now includes direct actions and um, ways to think about how art and culture can help mobilize um, people in their fight to stay in their homes. And um, I'm also working uh, in various coalitions. Uh, this is a poster I designed for Interference Archives to honor um, community uh, housing organizers in New York. Uh, and as a member or a fellow of the Monument Lab, uh, which is an organization that's now currently taking a very critical look at, at the monuments um, that have been uh, replaced 
hopefully, and taken down uh, that um, have were originally put up to um, uh, to commemorate um, w wars and and uh, white supremacy and um, events in in American history that we would like to um, to see replaced with with uh, uh, stories and um, and people that represent our communities. Um, and I'm just very honored to be part of uh, this cohort of artists who are really looking at ways to hold not only um, the monuments that we see in public spaces um, more accountable, but you know the institutions that build them as well. So I think I will end here and. Um, this is uh, also a project maybe I'll get to talk to a little bit, talk a little bit about uh, in our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tomia and Wenny. Thank you both um, for sharing all of that and just kind of giving us this inside look to both of your art practices. Um, I thought I would kind of just kick it off maybe um, and have just pose a question to you two um, about just after hearing your presentations, um, thinking about how your practices kind of really differ between like a studio practice or a more individual versus a social um, practice. And the both of you also, Wendy, with your performance art and you're still kind of, I feel like toggling between these creative spaces as well. Um, and yeah, I just kind of wanted to ask what, how, um, what that means for you now and in relation to kind of like these creative spaces being bubbles within a bigger world, um, how that affects what you're doing now. Um, that's, a, that's a great question, um, Vivian. You know, it's always been tricky for me because um, when I've done more larger installation pieces, they're very physically demanding and involved. And um, there's so much sort of process and people involved. And, um, and I, I did take a step away from working very large and in that very public way because I st it started to... Um, I don't kind of say this, I started to really feel like a job. Like I started to feel almost like in a way marginalized or pigeonholed into making a certain kind of work or there was an expectation for me to make a certain kind of work. Um, I felt this very sort of burden of responsibility and I didn't really know what to do with that. And so um, what I did was I channeled it into my teaching and I felt like it's difficult for me to be responsible for a public, but I can be responsible as a, as you know, someone in the classroom. <laughs> and um, and I, I felt much more comfortable sort of in a much more anonymous way um, being in the classroom and teaching one, you know, having more one-on-one -on -one interaction with people in terms of guiding them. And as I was guiding them, developing my own work in the process. Um, so so it's, it's, been, it's been tricky for me and it's interesting to see this sort of older work reemerge and, and to see it now, you know, almost 20 years later in some cases to, to sort of see how, how that is. Yeah. I don't know, Tamia, if you had some, um, if you wanted to add to that in any way. Wendy, I wonder if you could repeat the question. Um, if, if... Yeah, I was, I was just wondering, um, you know, thinking about both your and Wendy's practices, um, just thinking how you both kind of toggle between like a social practice and a studio practice and exist in those creative spaces within kind of our bigger moment that we're into right now. You know, I, I think that um, throughout my artistic career, I've tried to toggle between those two spaces and I feel like it's an ongoing um, challenge, um, which isn't to say that they can't exist at the same time, but um, they are very different spaces. And uh, sometimes, um, you know, I, I, I sometimes working differently is called for, you know, in both situations. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, every project that you do is is different and and calls for different solutions. And 
And sometimes it makes a lot of sense to bring what you do in the studio into what you do in your public work. Um, for instance, the monoprint that I did um, for the African burial ground came out of my printmaking you know, experience. Um, but being in a studio is, is in many ways solitary and um, you know, which is why I've chosen to work in workshops. And I really appreciate the community that I can find in um, spaces, workspace programs like Dudoné and um, a women's studio workshop, the Lower East Side print shop, because um, I've learned actually so much from other artists, more than I can say in any other situation. But working alongside artists is really what has shaped um, my practice. And I, I, I feel that it's so strongly when I talk to young people, you know, that you need to find a community of, of affinity, you know, that, and um, you can't, you can't work alone. So um, even if you're in your studio thinking and drawing, <laughs> you need, you need a community, a support community. Um, but right now, you know, I think that, you know, particularly in the midst of all this really troubling and disturbing anti-Asian violence and and also you know balanced by that you know these very inspiring you know protests for racial justice. I, I do feel like there are so many artists that are looking for ways to bring their practice out into the world. And um, you know the, if anything this is the time to do it. You know I would say don't hold back, you know, even if what you see is is available to you to do is nothing like what you do in your studio, you know, go for it. Cause I feel like, um, you know, we, we are now being asked to respond to what is going on and we have to bring our best selves, you know, to that challenge. Yeah, thank you, Tomia. Um, and actually kind of riffing off of that, what that made me think about is, um, you're saying just kind of like rising to the occasion and responding to this moment now. And I think also a lot about um, just kind of how the body is used in terms of that um, as an extension of the art practice, whether that's like you're saying, sh showing up, you know, at protests or your body in when your performance art um, and how that's kind of like a vessel through also which your art is made. Um, yeah, maybe I was just wondering if you could, the both of you could maybe comment and how that's affected your practice or um, yeah, how that plays into everything. Well, for me, you know, per, like personally, because, you know, my body has always been the thing that divided me from those around me because I grew up in upstate New York and I didn't, my family, we didn't look like anybody else. And so it wasn't something that I could erase or hide behind, you know, and, and so it has been really empowering for me to, um, to use my body in my work. And um, whether it's, you know, in fragments or as in, in the performance pieces, it's been also very enlightening. Um, and, um, and uh, to do that, um, you know, there was one performance piece I did where I was sort of still for six hours in an art space. And it was interesting to see how people would come in and treated me like an object instead of a person because I was immobile. That was very interesting. It was really um, somewhat disturbing, also enlightening um, to sort of go through that process. Um, but I also, it's, you know, for me, it's also the body is the vehicle through which I make the work. I mean, it's, um, you know, and, and, and I have abused my body <laughs> making my work where I make very um, meticulous work that where I've damaged my body and had to then, you know, sort of um, revise and, and readapt the way that, that, I, that I make my work. And so, so there has been that also. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a, it's very interesting to think about, um, the body and, and how it's been involved in my, my art making. That's a, a great question. And, you know, I think that, um, 
in fact, you know, a lot of my work has been portraiture, but um, I, I don't know that I've really felt comfortable bringing my own body <laughs> into the work in the, in, in the way that, that Wenny has done, which, you know, I, I just, I love those performance pieces. Um, I feel like, um, however, having just uh, recovered from COVID myself and, you know, going through this terrible year of the pandemic, I'm so aware now of um, not only aging, but, um, you know, the, the precarity, you know, of, of our, our health and our lives. And um, I do feel like there's, there's so much to understand about um, disability justice. And um, I completely uh, encourage and understand the, the reasons for um, so many people talking about communities of care and that, that we really do need to address um, how we show up and how we behave and also how we treat each other. And, you know, I've been doing um, oral histories, which is a form of, I guess, the body. Um, and uh, through a, a project called APA Voices, um, COVID-19 Public Memory Project. And, uh, you know, began with stories of, of how people are coping with COVID, but evolved into how people are dealing with the murder of George Floyd and the election and um, the, you know, just everything that has happened over the course of these past few months. And, um, you know, I do feel like we were never intending to collect stories of trauma, but in fact, everybody is <laughs> extremely traumatized, you know, whether, whether that's physically or, you know, really something that we're not going to know for years to come. But, um, I, I think that um, understanding how the impact of historical events and is impacting us and our bodies and how we treat each other um, is so important at this moment. Yeah, um, thank you both for that. Um, I think we're running out of time. I see Dijonae is coming up. Um, so I think there might not be any other further questions, um, but, yeah, I think we might have to wrap up. Sorry that that ran a bit long, everyone. But um, thank you so much, um, Tomi and Wenny, for being a part of this. And thank you to Didone and Willa for doing the back end tech for everything. Um, and yeah, feel free um, to all of the information is up on the exhibition website that can still be found up online. And um, yeah, it's been really nice to have everyone here today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. We're so lucky to have you here. Thank you.